life of a half French noble, the illegitimate son of Thimbord and nephew of Charlemagne, who finds himself in conflict with his family, battling his French cousin Boisseau and challenging his half brother in the French court. The continuity between these three incidents in Bernardo's life and the repeated references to Cantares suggest that there probably once existed at least one multi episodic cantar that would have related, at the very least, the tale of an illegitimate half French noble called Bernardo. What we have to ask then is whether the cantar reported more than just those three episodes, how or why it was created, and how it was known by the 13th century chroniclers and authors. When addressing other episodes that might have been included in the Cantar, the two most pertinent are the Battle of Frontis Valles and Bernardo's deeds upon leaving the French court, as both have ties either to French material or to Bernardo's half-French origins. Also relevant is the delivery of Sandias's corpse, an episode in which the Cantares are mentioned, though the incident appears to be unique in theme. Bernardo's first appearance in the Battle of Frontis Valles is in Lucas de Tui's Cronica Mundi. In the Latin text, Charlemagne writes to Alfonso III declaring the Leonese monarch to be his vassal. Bernardo, angry, decides to help Marsilio, the Muslim king of Saragossa, in his fight against the French king. He and Marsilio, along with Marsilio's troops, battle the French, where Roland and a number of the peers are killed. Lucas de Tui also includes a second um, battle with the French, in which Bernardo, and this time Musa, king of Saragossa, battle French troops near the foot of the Pyrenees. Um, in Jimenez de Rada's account of Frances Valles, it's Alfonso who contacts Charlemagne, sending ambassadors and proposing that since he, Alfonso, has no heirs and he's getting old and weary, um, he would turn his kingdom over to Charlemagne if the latter would come help him in his battles against Muslim armies. And Charlemagne agrees. Once Alf Alfonso's vassals learn of this pact, they, and particularly Bernardo, insist that the king revoke his promise, affirming that they would rather die as free men than live under the service of um, of the French. Alfonso agrees, which brings Charlemagne to Spain. Um, the emperor and his troops advance to Valcarlos, where in the vanguard, Roland and the peers are defeated by Alfonso and his men. And upon discovering the defeat, Charlemagne sounds his horn, causing some to flee towards the rear guard, where, as Jimenez de Rada states, fama erat, or it was said, that Bernardo was waiting with an army of Muslims. But Jimenez de Rada doesn't believe this, and he immediately adds a specification that no, no, Bernardo was always in the vanguard with Alfonso. This, the Battle of Frontes Valles and Bernardo's involvement is also recorded in the first part of the Poema de Fernando González. And in this version, Charlemagne alerts Alfonso II that he's coming to take Spain. Bernardo gathers his troops um, and confronts the emperor's army at Fuente Rabia, where many are killed. After the initial battle, Charlemagne and his troops flee towards Zaragoza and continue on to the Puertos de Aspa. Bernardo journeys to Zaragoza, where he meets Marsilio. And there he kisses the king's hands and requests that he be or requests that his troops be allowed to fight first. Uh, Mar Marsilio agrees, and with Bernardo in the vanguard, the, um, his troops Castilian in the Poema de Fernando González defeat the French. And as the Alfonsin chroniclers narrate the defeat of, at Frontes Valles, they don't allude to the Cantares ever. Rather, they seem to rely solely on the Cronica Mundi and the Rebus Hispaniae for their account including all of the details from the two Latin texts and repeatedly referencing their sources when those two versions contradict each other. So we can't say for certain that they used Cantares as well, but it is possible that Lucas de Tui and Jimenez de Rada relied on a Cantar or Cantares in their account of Frances Valles. While previous materials such as the Song of Roland or the Cerro Turpin and the Historia Silense tied Marsilio to the battle, Lucas de Tui was the first to include Alfonso II's correspondence with Charlemagne and Bernardo's involvement in the incident. Considering the shared ties to Charlemagne in this and other episodes, specifically Bernardo's birth and his visit to the French court, as well as the double appearance of battles with the French, the second being the combat with Boiso, it's reasonable that some version of the confrontation at Crotes Valles figured into the same cantar that related Bernardo's birth to Timbor, his battle with Boiso, and his altercation with his half-brother. This version of Frances Valles may have differed in some respects from the retellings in the Cronica Muni de Rebus Hispaniae, the Poema de Fernando González in the Historia de España, but it probably featured some sort of communication between Alfonso and Charlemagne, Bernardo's alliance with Marsilio, and the victory over the French. This inclusion of Frances Valles in the Cantar would solidify Bernardo's role as an Iberian hero, vanquisher of the French on more than one occasion. We also have to consider Bernardo's deeds upon leaving the French court in conjunction with the Cantar de Bernardo, given that their catalyst was his rejection by Timbor's son, his half-brother, so still dealing with his lineage. 
As Bernardo's encounter in Charles's court is reported, the primary information taken from the Cantares seems to be the details of his lineage and his unpleasant interaction with his half-brother. And this is from section four in your handout. Nevertheless, given the immediate continuation of the episode, it's plausible that the details that followed also stemmed, at least in part, from the same cantar. And um, the details are Bernardo gets really upset that his brother challenges him and then leaves. Um, and Carlos, or Charles, gives him horses and goods and sends him on his way. And although the chroniclers might have filled in certain particulars, it's likely that the cantar would have at least provided the skeleton of the outline, or the skeleton of the episode. The sources become unclear, however, once the chroniclers begin their account of Bernardo's deeds after leaving the court, his settling in the Canal de Jaca, conquests in Sobrarbe and surrounding areas, marriage to Galinda, and the birth of his son, Galin Galindes. Numerous scholars have linked these deeds to Bernardo Riva Borsa, a 9th century noble from present-day Aragon. M. Serrano y Sanz and Francisco Batista have discussed falsified information that appears in 10th and 11th century documents in which Bernardo of Riva Borsa is described both as a descendant of Charlemagne, like Bernardo de Carpio, and as conquering similar areas that Bernardo conquers in the Historia de España. And so through these documents, some see part of the origin of Bernardo's legend. So assuming that Bernardo of Riva Borsa's supposed conquests and ties to Charlemagne were at least part of the genesis of the legend about Bernardo, they very likely would have figured into the same, into the cantar mentioned by the chroniclers, though they might not have been the central feature. Rather, the cantar, perhaps influenced by Roland's tale, both for the presence of Francis Valles, and also the account of Bernardo's half-French lineage parallels to a certain respect accounts of Roland's lineage. Um, this tale would have related the story of a half-French hero who was victorious against both French and Muslim foes and who ultimately settled in the northern part of the Iberian Peninsula. The last episode to consider with regard to the content of the Bern Cantar de Bernardo is the delivery of Sandias' corpse to Bernardo. As I discussed above, this episode differs from others in which the Cantares were mentioned because it doesn't relate to Bernardo's half-French lineage. Instead, it revolves around the imprisonment of the Count of Saldania, which leads to Bernardo's conflicts with Alfonso III. Consequently, the delivery of Bernardo's deceased father, a death that occurred in prison and isn't mentioned in any other instance related to the Cantares, probably has little place in a cantar that would have related the deeds of the half-French hero. Alternatively, it is more plausible that the above episode was related in some independent episodic cantar, more akin to later romances, printed in the 15th and 16th centuries, which would have centered on the immediate conflict between Alfonso and Bernardo. In addition to its content, the four 13th century accounts of Bernardo's legend give indications as to how this cantar would have been known, with the conflicting accounts of Francis Valles and the double reference to Nestoria and the Cantares in the episode of Hueso, suggesting that this cantar was probably indirectly known by the chroniclers. The four versions of the battle at Francis Valles differ in numerous respects. First, the location of the battle varies. Francis Valles, Val Carlos, Fuente Rabia, and the Puertos de Aspa are all mentioned as possible sites for the victory. Second, the chroniclers and authors present contradictory information regarding the number of battles. Both Lucas de Tui and the author of the Poema de Fernando González include two battles against the French, while Jiménez de Rada and the Alfax and Jack only mention one, and Lucas de Tui includes two different alliances of Bernardo with Muslim kings. Um, and lastly, there are divergent accounts of the initial correspondence between Alfonso II and Charlemagne. Lucas de Tui and the Poema de Fernando González state that Charlemagne was the one who initiated the contact, declaring Alfonso to be his vassal, and Jiménez de Rada, who tends to write very favorably of past monarchs, claims that it was Alfonso who first reached out to the emperor, so this is a moment where he doesn't make Alfonso look very good. Um, so these disparities, central to the episode, suggest that at least some of the chroniclers and authors probably didn't have access to the contact, but only knew of it. Um, an exception to the notion that the Alfonsine scribes did not know the cantar uh, directly is a preserved assonance in the report of Bernardo's combat with Poiso, and that is in section two of your document. But in that particular case, the chroniclers cite the cantares indirectly through the Historia, so it seems more likely that it was the author of the Historia who would have initially incorporated the rhyme, who probably had direct access to the cantar. That the chroniclers knew of the cantar de Bernardo indirectly could possibly explain why they only referenced cantares in the plural. They didn't have any singular cantar to refer to, but they only knew that one existed and used cantares to make an indirect reference. This cantar would have recounted the deeds of the illegitimate half-French noble Bernardo, who found himself at odds with his French relatives. He would have participated in the victory over his maternal uncle tro uncle's troops at Francis Valles, perhaps more than once, defeated his cousin Boiso in one-on-one -on -one combat, and challenged his half-French brother in the French court. 
He would have expelled Muslim adversaries from various zones in the northern Iberian Peninsula and would have settled in what is present-day Aragon, where he would have married Galinda, had a son, Galin Galindas, and lived out the remainder of his days. <laughs> Check if it works because it's the first time I use it. Okay, perfect. <coughs> uh, hello to everybody and thanks for coming. Um, although the name of Félix Rodríguez de la Fuente uh, may not strike a chord among scholars and the general educated public uh, outside the Iberian Peninsula and the Spanish-speaking world, he achieved during his lifetime and unique celebrity and cultural iconic status as a naturalist, broadcaster, wildlife filmmaker, and popular science author in Spain and to a lesser, to a lesser extent in Portugal and Latin America. In my dissertation, I focus on the work that contributed the most to establish the reputation and national celebrity status of Rodriguez de la Fuente as a naturalist filmmaker and wildlife conservation activist. The wildlife film series El Hombre y la Tierra serie Fauna Ibérica, broadcasters between 1975 and 1981, and were run several times in later decades. Many Spanish scholars, journalists, intellectuals, and conservation activists have insisted, insisted on the lasting influence this series had on the Spanish society because they argue it introduced and popularized scientific and conservationist understandings of the, of the national wildlife in a country which, up to that point, had remained culturally backward and insensitive to environmental concerns. This idea, which became a widespread cultural historical cliche in Spain, signals the work of Rodriguez de la Fuente as a crucial symbolic site, not only to observe key transformations in how nature and wild animals were framed or translated to mass audiences, but also to study the connections among scientific discourse, non-human animals, and narrative of modernization in late 20th century Spain. Uh, although the popular Rodriguez de la Fuente took the spotlight in the promotion of the series, exerted the heavy-handed leading role as director and shaped the work's particular narrative style as a voice, as voice over narrator and on-camera presenter, Fauna Iberica was indeed a collective media project. As in other classic works of the wildlife film genre, the series crew included many cinematographers, animal trainers, scientific advisors, as well as several institutional sponsors, the Radio Televisión Española and the ICONA, the, the Environmental Agency of Spain, and collaborators. Moreover, the list of participants in the production of the series must also acknowledge the documented presence and activity of uncredited non-humans not only the trained, tamed, captive, or human habituated animal actors recruited to unwittingly perform in the series, but also the many technological objects and techniques employed to register, perform, interpret, frame, narrate, and commodify Iberian wildlife to uh, mass audiences. In order, uh, in order to be able to account for the activity and, and interconnections of all those diverse actors and agents, my approach to the study of Fauna Berica is grounded in a relational ontology, inspired by the actor network theory tradition. Let me talk, about, uh, uh, let me talk a bit about my theore theoretical approach. Simply put, uh, with the term relational ontology, I mean a way to understand 
uh, the diverse entities that populate the world as fundamentally interconnected in a way to understand their agency and activity as the product of those relations. This relational ontology, of course, challenges conventional divides between the single natural world studied by scientists and the diverse cultural activity of humans. According to A and T scholars, both humans and non-humans, such as artifacts, texts, rocks, plants, animals, and even microorganisms, need to be studied symmetrically and relationally. That is, they cannot be divided anthropocentrically or naturalistically into active subjects, passive or malleable natural objects, and neutral technical intermediaries about, between both. According to Bruno Latour, this division is just a stabilized ideological result of particular historical arrangements with roots in the scientific, philosophical, and political innovations of 17th century Europe. And it cannot hold up a close empirical examination of the proliferation of nature cultural hybrids, hybrids, which are especially noticeable during processes of modernization. Some environmental historians and geographers have worked along similar lines. Greg Mitman has focused in the material semiotic intersection of animals, humans, spaces, cultural values, scientific discourse, and te technological artifacts. A particular vis particularly vis visual technologies in order to account for the social environmental power relations that regulate interactions among people, wildlife, and environments. On the other hand, the geographers Whitehead, Johnson Jones have investigated how the development of modern states gave rise to the formation of, of state natures. That is, the particular territorial framings, uh, technical scientific understandings, and bureaucratic managements of, of the non-human world that became dominant with the development of modern states. In my study, I understand wildlife films not only as cinematic texts or embodied performances, but also as historical material events and as the portable, transmittable, long influential, and long lasting outcome of the activity of many interrelated actants temporal, temporally, temporarily, <laughs> and roll into a collective. Furthermore, wildlife itself is conceived as the historical and relational outcome of heterogeneous networks and translating processes that mobilized and enmeshed people, animals, soils, documents, and technologies. In the light, on one hand, popular classic wildlife film series such as Found Iberica are in themselves powerful agents in the sense of non-human actants able to influence others' other, others' behaviors and beliefs uh, in the material semiotic assemblage, enactment, and stabilization of modern wildlife and nature at a national or transnational scale. On the other hand, they constitute critical sites to explore how contemporary wildlife and nature were assembled, formatted, standardized, and transmittable in particular ways and with particular ethics and biopolitical implications. In the next part uh, of uh, these presentations, I would like to explain how Fine Iberica materially enacted the idea of a modern national nature as a new national natural heritage and how the series contributed to the formation of a new national biopolitical space that defined and regulated the relations and interactions between humans and wildlife. According to Ramos Gorostiza, Francoist environmental policy and wildlife management was dominated by an engineering perspective and reflected a strongly utilitarian and productivist approach to the natural world. Therefore, up to the 1970s, until the conservationist agenda promoted by international organizations such as the World Wildlife Fund began to be felt in Spain, all the plants, soils, and animals of the Spanish territory were, were managed by the state's forestry and agric agricultural agency in relation to agricultural and raw material productions and the traditional practice of hunting. In this manner, most predators all predators, sorry, were um, catalogued as pests to be exterminated because they made game animals less abundant. Forest marshes, on the other hand, were assessed and often destroyed according to their potential for agricultural production. 
It was just in the final years of Francoism, the 1970s, when a nature conservation policy formally appeared with the passing of new hunting legislation and the declaration of a new protectors of the spaces. Notwithstanding the inadequacies and hollowness of the new state conservationist institutions and laws during the late Francoism and the transition, the Spanish state redefined and enrolled in ways at once material and discursive some of the newly pr protected and semi-protected spaces and species in order to manufacture a new Spanish natural heritage made up of national treasures for the enjoyment of Spaniards and foreign tourists. Rodríguez de la Fuentes, Fauna Ibérica, produced by the monopolistic state television in collaboration with the new State Conter Conservation Institute, not only reproduced this uh, redefinition of state nature in Spain, but in fact it was the most crucial agent in the enactment of Spain's new national natural heritage. Likewise, this television series constitutes a key agent for the emergence of a new national biopolitical space, because it showed pedagogically to most audiences what their new national nature was about, what it was for, and how interactions with wild, wildlife populations should be. In order to get a glimpse um, of this process, I will dedicate the concluding section of this talk to comment briefly on the first episode of the series. In March 1975, uh, Radio Televisión Española broadcasted in prime time the first episode of Fauna Ibérica, titled Los Prisioneros del Bosque, The Prisoners of the Forest. Like many other episodes of Fauna Iberica, it was shot and edited according to the basic rule of the classic wildlife film genre that consisted in not showing any trace of human presence on camera so that nature was presented as something pure and untouched by, by human civilization. The human presence in this episode is thus circumscribed to the idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic voiceover narration of Félix Rodríguez de la Fuente. In his narration of the initial sequence of Los Prisioneros, in which panoramic shots of forests alternate with different shots of the animals he mentions, the narrator points out that, quote, in tiempos históricos, España fue un paraíso forestal, eh, in which un águila, as that one, um, un águila imperial, la reina de las aves de nuestros bosques, hubiera podido atravesar la península ibérica, I'm trying, kind of trying to imitate the voice of the guy, <laughs> <laughs> eh, hubiera podido atravesar la península ibérica sin dejar de sobrevolar sobre un infinito manto. <laughs> This former natural splendor of the nation is later contrasted with its present state. I quote again, Aunque España es un mosaico de ecosistemas en el que predominan sobre todo las estepas y llanuras subdesérticas, las últimas masas de nuestros bosques en la cordillera pirenaica y cantábrica, en los sistemas montañosos del centro del sur, permiten todavía que nuestras últimas águilas puedan sobrevivir en un paisaje que debió constituir la generalidad de la península ibérica. In this way, through the arrangement of music, images, and voice-over narration, fragments of nature, plants, animals, and spaces are removed and abstracted from their local, ecological, political, and social environmental contexts, so that they enact the present and past of the Spanish nation. Felix Ward also interpolate audiences as the collective owners of the Spanish forests and wildlife, and at the same time, outline a verbal map of the national natural territory in order to assess what is left of the format forest paradise the nation used to be. In this manner, the voiceover narration establishes the particular um, national state frame and the conservationist discourse that will guide the Spanish audiences um, interpretation and experience of the film, of the filmic images of the series, and that will, that will influence their own personal attitudes and, and expectations in relation with local wild animals and their habitats. In Rodriguez de la Fuente's concluding remarks at the end of the episode, we find an emphatic exhortation to conserve the receding national forests and its endangered wildlife. Uno, contemplando la gran nevada que se ve en la pantalla, puede tomar conciencia de la obligación de cada español para conservar nuestros últimos bosques. 
la administración hace mucho para conservarlos. And that wasn't true at that time. Pero todos y cada uno de, nuestros, de nosotros debemos ser conscientes de que somos un país de forestal, de que debemos conservar cada árbol, cada criatura del bosque. Si nosotros no terminamos con sus refugios eh, forestales, podrán sobrevivir durante siglos y siglos eh, y las generaciones venideras podrán deleitarse con su contemplación y con su estudio. La fuerza, el vigor, la presencia mítica de nuestros animales seguirá presente en los restantes capítulos de nuestra historia y las heráldicas águilas españolas podrán decorar con su vuelo los cielos de nuestros últimos bosques. These fragments show how particular spaces, species, and animal bodies physically removed from their habitats as extracted from the local context and codified through photographic means and classic wildlife film form were being enrolled by the Spanish state as a new national natural heritage. By means of Felix's voiceover narration, a contemporary images are presented as the documents of the nation's past richness whose present Remain remnants who need to be preserved as natural treasures for future generations. This labor of preservation not only concerns the administration by all the Spaniards who, when watching the images of Fauna Iberica, need to take consciousness of their obligations as citizens to conserve their national animals and forests. Uh, Felix also points out to two proper ways for Spaniards to enjoy this natural heritage. One is the contemplation in the scientific study, and the other, the scientific study of the national nature. And as a final end note, just to conclude, I'd like to point out that even though scientific discourse um, is prominent in Fauna Iberica, in Fauna Iberica material enactment of the national nature, the reference to heraldic Spanish eagles and to the mythic presence of Iberian large mammals and bears also show the role that traditional discourses and cultural symbols play in this process.